Hey, this is Dina. You finally got me to talk about the Silent Hill movie. I hope you're happy. But in all seriousness, since I am a Silent Hill fan, I have been making videos about that series for years and how I'm rather opinionated about the series overall, it's only natural that people have been wanting me to do a review of some kind of the movie. The problem with the Silent Hill movie is that it's oddly controversial. It's like you have people who love it, people who hate it, and when they get together, bad stuff happens. And I have to admit, sometimes when I've tried to talk about what I dislike about the movie, I feel like Dib in this scene. We've been passing the same stuff over and over again. Look at that dog! That dog's gone by four, maybe five times already! What's wrong with the dog? Yeah, I like the dog. So why am I talking about it now? Well, I guess some part of me has always wanted to give my official two cents on this rather than just taking little jabs at it in my other videos. Also, not too long ago, I caught an episode of Atop the Fourth Wall, where Linkara talked about the 15 things that are wrong with Identity Crisis, because apparently it's a comic book series that a lot of people like, and rather than try to change anyone's opinions, because he knew he couldn't, he just wanted to state his case about what he thought was wrong with it, and basically lay his cards on the table. And that got me thinking about the Silent Hill movie and how I feel kind of similarly about it, and I figured this was a good way to approach it. I really don't want to go through and cover the whole movie. It's been done, and oh hell, I just didn't want to do it, okay? So I'm just taking all the rants I probably would have made and condensing them into five major problems I had with the movie. Just one of these things by itself might not have been a deal breaker, but all together they form a perfect storm of suckitude, in my opinion. Now, believe it or not, I do get why some of you like this movie. It looks good, it's dark, it's scary and intense, at least on the first viewing. The special effects are ridiculously good, and it does have cool little moments here and there. I like the use of the orange lighting to remind us of fire, and the music could not have been better. And this is not me trying to change anyone's mind. I'm mainly just laying all my cards out on the table and answering the question a lot of people ask me, just why do you hate the Silent Hill movie so much? Well, here you go. The top five things I hate about the Silent Hill movie. And I know you may be thinking, what, only five? Well, they are five big things, and they are things I have a lot to say about. Number five. I'm still debating with myself about whether this one should be higher on the list, but I guess I look at it this way. Homecoming is about as subtle as a kick to the head. You gotta be shitting me! But I do still generally like the story, and I care about the characters, so... I guess I can accept a lack of subtlety in a Silent Hill story. It's not a good thing, but it's something that I can overlook if other aspects are good or at least compelling enough to make up for it. That said, one of the best aspects about the Silent Hill series overall is that it takes a less is more approach to storytelling, and usually doesn't show you more than you need to see or tell you more than you need to know about what's going on, and it lets you mentally fill in the gaps and figure things out for yourself. Now, of course, there are exceptions here and there, even outside Homecoming, but generally the series does not hold your hand and walk you through the story, and it doesn't tend to revel in being super graphic. As for the movie, first let's start with the gore. With people being reduced to bloody hamburger by barbed wire. A flashback showing Alessa's nude body being suspended over flaming coals. I know it's not all that graphic, but they do still essentially show a ten-year-old child being cooked alive. Not to mention her charred remains directly afterwards. The close-up on Sybil's face showing the skin boiling off as she gets the same treatment. And of course, Pyramid Head flaying someone and then throwing her skin at the freaking gate, which is gruesome to the point of being hilarious. This movie is just way more graphic than it needs to be. Because, seriously, where did all this come from? Remember, the Silent Hill movie came out after Silent Hill 4. When did we see anything like this in those games? Especially in the first one. You know, the game the movie's supposed to be based on? Oh sure, there was gore in the form of lots of blood everywhere and icky corpses because that's how Alessa's poor traumatized mind saw the world after she was burned. We didn't see her being burned. We didn't have to. We get why being burned alive is a horrible thing to have happen to you. We don't need to have it shown to us for what probably adds up to about a minute. We're not stupid. And even though Pyramid Head being a monster rapist in Silent Hill 2 has become something of an inside joke among the fans, even those scenes aren't exactly graphic, and in the case of the first instance, it goes by pretty quick. First time I played the game, I couldn't even tell what he was doing. In any case, we didn't need to see him rip anyone's skin off to know that he's dangerous. 
They also try to over-explain how and why things happen. Having a parent taking their kid to a resort town is enough. We need to be shown that the kid is having nightmares and conveniently yelling out the name of the town. And have the parent decide that it's a good idea to take her there. The echo of crying in a bathroom. We couldn't just be left to put two and two together and figure out that Alessa went to the bathroom to cry because the other kids were making fun of her. That's not enough of an explanation. It's gotta be because something bad happened to her in there. Which turns out to be that she was raped by a janitor. We can't just assume that the snow is snow. It's gotta be ash from an underground fire that's still burning. Although the movie doesn't make it quite clear where it came from. I'll get to that and some other stuff later. And don't even get me started on this little monologue. Congratulations, Rose. You're here. You did it. Your reward is exposition. One of this movie's biggest flaws as an adaptation of Silent Hill, if not a movie, is that it throws subtlety out the window in favor of just shoving everything in your face as if you're too dumb to figure out what's going on unless they do. This is not what Silent Hill is about. Number four. This one particularly bugs me, because while the movie goes out of its way to be different from the first game, mostly to its own detriment, it simultaneously puts these silly little nods to the game as if throwing us a bone. It feels kind of condescending to me. It's like, yeah, sorry, no Harry Mason, but look at Rose! Doesn't she totally look like a more grown-up Heather? See, we know our stuff! And there's a scene where Rose is in a car in the rain while Letter from Lost Days is playing on the radio, which is supposed to remind us of the scene in Silent Hill 3 where that song plays in Douglas's car in the rain. The thing is, Letter from Lost Days is about a woman looking back on her childhood and contemplating if she grew up to be as happy as she always hoped she'd be when she was a little girl. And because it's playing while Heather mourns the death of her father, it's just so deep and poignant I can get choked up just thinking about it. It just does not have the same impact in this scene where Rose has been pulled over by a cop and she's contemplating gunning it. If they were smart, they would have saved it for a possible sequel, but instead they chose to try to cram as much of the first four games into the movie as they could, so I guess there won't be any attempt to replicate this scene in Silent Hill Revelations 3D. Then again, they're using the same nurses and Pyramid Head again, so who knows. Speaking of which, you knew it was coming. Pyramid Head is probably the biggest and most blatant aspect of Silent Hill lore to be thrown into this movie completely out of context. Granted, he doesn't have a whole lot of screen time, but that almost makes it worse in a way. Pyramid Head used to be something unique. He used to symbolize something. Now he's just one more reused monster among many in this movie and the two following games. And I know some people like the refurbished theory of Pyramid Head as a symbol of guilt, revenge, justice, whatever to explain why he's in this movie and the later games, but the Book of Lost Memories states, in reference to whether or not Pyramid Head was the quote-unquote red devil seen by Walter Sullivan, that only James Sunderland in Silent Hill 2 can see Pyramid Head. He was supposed to have been James's personal demons given a solid form. And some people like to argue that the movie takes place in its own continuity, so it's okay for Pyramid Head to be there. And I guess I can't technically argue with that, but if nothing else, his appearance in the movie opened the door for him showing up in later games, and that is something I am not okay with and never will be. You cannot allow a Bible of your series to be published and then turn right around and try to retcon something in it. And don't get me wrong, there are some nods to various games that I don't mind, and if the movie had stayed close to the plot of the first game and just kind of added some nods to the sequels as extras, I would have been fine with that. But instead, they end up taking important characters and plot points and throwing them in as Easter eggs instead of staying true to the source material. And taking a lot of this stuff out of context makes it meaningless. I'm especially annoyed with Lisa's role being reduced to a cameo that involves something happening to her that only vaguely resembles what happened in the game. And again, taken totally out of context and pretty much rendered meaningless. It'd be like if they left Judd Crandall out of Pet Cemetery, but still had some random old man wave at Lewis from across the street in one scene as a nod to it. I didn't want this stuff left out, but if you're gonna do it anyway, just leave it out. Don't try to make up for it like this, it just feels condescending. And I know the director is a Silent Hill fan, and I'm sure the real reason he put this stuff in is because he loves it and he just couldn't resist. Unfortunately, it doesn't tend to come across that way. At least not to me. Number three. So, um, they adapted a story and changed the main character pretty much completely, including the gender. The lead character of, of Silent Hill 1 is a man named Harry Mason. And he worked 
very well in the game. But when we start to write him, respecting his personality, we found that it's a woman. He elaborates on it in this article. We realized after two weeks in the writing process that Harry was actually motivated by feminine, almost maternal feelings. To be true to the character, it was very odd and difficult to write for him. He worked fine in the game, but as a real actor, it was too strange. It's not that he's effeminate, but he's acting like a woman. <laughs> Gee, it sounds an awful lot like you're saying that a father wouldn't have it in him to want to track down and save his daughter. And I'm sorry, how exactly does Harry act like a woman? He takes charge of his situation as much as he can, he's protective of his daughter, he's protective of the two women he meets, I personally believe that's partly because he's a widower. In any case, he's very protective of the women in his life. I'd say that's a masculine trait. Hell, as of Silent Hill 3, he went all commando on a cult member to protect Heather at one point. If anything, I'd say he's a pretty damn good male role model. I know he's a bit bland in the first game, but he could have easily been made into a great character. I know people love the complexity of James Sunderland, and I do too, but there's just something so warm and appealing about Harry Mason, at least as a concept. It's like if James is Batman and Harry is Superman. One is dark and complex and easy to be fascinated with, and it's easy to see why he's popular. The other is a lot more simple and straightforward, but you can't help but love him if only for the ideals that he represents. As if our culture doesn't downplay the importance of fatherhood enough already, someone has to come along and basically go, All those positive traits? Psh, father wouldn't do any of that. Make it a mother. That's believable. I love Harry Mason, and I would have wanted to see him portrayed in this movie, but I'm not sure if his absence bothers me half as much as the reasoning for it. I'm sorry, but where I come from, we call that sexism. Oh well. Just makes me love shattered memories that much more, I guess. It'll be interesting to see if they make up for this in Revelation, since it appears that Sean Bean's character is more or less morphed into Harry Mason. And he does resemble Harry from Shattered Memory, so that's kind of interesting. Number 2 It goes without saying that a movie adaptation of anything is going to make some changes. This one is an extreme case as it is, but what bothers me the most is that they picked such a cliché and overused plot point to change it to. In the original game, Dahlia had Alessa burned alive and put into a coma because she was meant to give birth to an evil god and her suffering would feed and nurture it. Claudia's monologuing in Silent Hill 3 helps to flesh it out a little bit. In the movie, Alessa is accused of being a witch because, and this is the only reason given, no one knows who her father is and so they got a craving for baked Alessa. Yeah, really. A witch burning in the 1970s by what has got to be the most puritanical cult in history. So I have a problem with this for many reasons. First of all, yes, people were tried and convicted of witchcraft in the past. The thing is, this was centuries ago, and it's something we tend to look back on with bafflement because it's just so damn irrational. All I'm saying is that if your story involves a witch burning and it doesn't take place in the 1600s, we're gonna need a little more convincing than, oh, she didn't have a dad or something. Anyway, back to how mean they were, those big meanies. It's cliche, but it can technically be pulled off. It's just gotta have some thought put into it. There's gotta be a reason why a large group of people is going to be this irrational. Take Gingerbread, a season three episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for example. Buffy's mom goes out on patrol with her where she finds two dead children whose deaths are believed to be occult-related. She tells everyone in town about it and starts an organization to fight the occult, which turns out to include Buffy and her friends who are witches. Buffy begins to put two and two together when she realizes that nothing is known about the two children other than their deaths. It turns out that these exact same children are found murdered every 50 years dating back to the 1600s. They inspired the story of Hansel and Gretel and set off the Salem witch trials. It turns out to be a demon who takes the form of these two children. Some demons thrive by fostering hatred and, and uh, persecution amongst the mortal animals. Not by, not by destroying men, but by watching men destroy each other. And of course, all this leads up to the witch burning scene. All this is pretty cleverly put together. Not only do we get ample reason how the situation escalated to a witch burning, but it's even linked to the Salem witch trials, which helps to kind of ground it in reality a little bit. It also doesn't hurt that Buffy is a show that tends to be very tongue-in-cheek, so it can generally get away with a lot. Did I get it? We're here to save you. 
Here's another example. The season one episode of the Dead Zone series called Here There Be Monsters. Psychic Johnny Smith is traveling through the small town of Hobbs Landing, Massachusetts, on his way home from having his head checked, when he runs into a police officer who mentions that there's an ongoing murder case. A double homicide last night. Mother and her eight-year-old daughter out in the woods. Second daughter still missing. Thirteen years old. Well, my friend is... He's helped the police up in Maine every now and then. The cops do not believe that he is psychic. Instead, they think he's the murderer since he knows too much about the crime. So they decide to keep him on a bogus charge to buy them enough time to figure out how he did it. Violation of local ordinance 65, practice of witchcraft. Johnny is, of course, found not guilty of practicing witchcraft. But meanwhile, the townspeople are really jittery about Johnny. This is a very small town where everybody knows everybody and they're all very torn up about the murders of this mother and daughter and the missing second daughter. And once Johnny discovers that the missing girl is still alive and the police are told where to look, the townspeople just snap and the witch hunt ensues. I'm not going to give away the ending to this one because it's a great twist. You'll have to look it up and watch it yourself. But this is another good example of that whole burn the witch trope being handled well. There's less of an explanation than in Gingerbread, but it's set up in such a way that it makes sense. No one actually believes Johnny is a witch, despite his psychic power being a logical reason as to why they could. The scene where Johnny is tied to a stake and they get set to burn him alive is actually an interrogation scene, and because the murders were satanic in nature, to them this is probably poetic justice. The Dead Zone is really good at taking a plot that is kinda cliche and making it work. It's currently on Netflix Instant, by the way, so if you wanna watch it... But I digress. As for the Silent Hill movie, well, they do show that the cult has a bit of an obsession with burning people as witches, so it's not like Alessa's fate just kind of happens completely out of nowhere. But then again, there's no real reason given except that it's just something they do in, in the 1970s. I just don't buy it. It just didn't have enough setup to make it believable, in my opinion. In the games, it's mentioned that Alessa had powers of some kind. In the movie, she has no powers, and yet somehow is believed to be a witch. What? Number one. The complaint I hear from supporters of this movie a lot is, oh, people just went in with unrealistic expectations. They're just mad because it's not exactly like the game down to the smallest detail. Well, that's an unfair assumption. I actually went into this movie knowing that they replaced Harry with Rose, and I figured it probably wouldn't follow the game's plot too closely. I was actually not the serious fan I am now, and even though I thought it was an odd choice, I was okay with it, or at least willing to give it a chance. Even now, I wouldn't have minded if they just forewent the plot of the game completely and did their own entirely original story with their own monster designs the way some of the more inventive fanfic writers have done. Or they could even have done a prequel of some kind, fleshing out some aspect of the town's history. So, no. I mean, I definitely would have wanted to see an adaptation of the first game, but the movie didn't have to be that as far as I'm concerned. My main problem with this movie is that even as a standalone movie, it's just not that good. The characters are stupid and act irrationally, and the story is a big convoluted mess. Which is weird, because usually movie adaptations leave things out. This one did leave things out, but I think it added more than it removed, partly because it's always trying to explain things it didn't need explaining. Really, the game story was a lot more straightforward. It starts off with a child sleepwalking dangerously close to the edge of a cliff, and it's made clear that this has happened many times before. If you have a child who's known to sleepwalk, why the hell do you live so close to a cliff? I'm just gonna gloss over how convenient it is as she screams Silent Hill with perfect clarity and skip to the mom taking her there despite the fact that the daughter is obviously terrified of it. It's apparently illegal to go there and the air is toxic. Not to mention that she runs away from a police officer in the process like that's not gonna come back and bite her later. Now what is so wrong with having the movie start off with them just about to visit what they think is a normal resort town, like in the game, and just skip all that nonsense? Here's another thing, the snow being ash. When I first saw this movie, I thought that was kind of cool. It made me think of Schindler's List. Problem is that the movie doesn't make it very clear where the ash comes from. Well, I think we're supposed to believe it happened when they burned Alessa because we do see the burning coal spill onto the floor and there's a big gaping hole there afterwards. Not sure how realistic that is. Plus, we never see any ash coming out from that hole. 
Also, since it's inspired by the real abandoned town of Centralia, which has a coal mine fire, I think a lot of people assume that that's all it is. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't just base it off of, oh, I don't know, the town of Silent Hill, but whatever. I could shrug it off as not really coming from anywhere in particular and just being symbolic, except that it's in the real world, too. It's a neat idea in theory, and it's probably just meant to add to the theme of fire that this movie has, along with the orange lighting and the enemies burning up. Unfortunately, it's just unnecessary, and in the end it only causes confusion. I already mentioned this one, but it bears repeating. Alessa being raped, or at least molested by a janitor. Again, they're trying to add explanation to something that didn't need it, but also there's some wonky logic at work here. At what school would they have a male janitor in the girls' restroom during school hours? Especially one run by a cult that's so puritanical they scream, BURN THE WITCH! over a child not having a known father? I've already talked about the witch burning angle and why that doesn't work, so I won't go into that again. Here's another one. Sybil murdering herself just pisses me right off. There is no damn reason for it, for one thing. What she does right here, she could have done just as easily from inside the elevator with Rose. It could be that she figures that if they're busy killing her, they'll forget about Rose long enough for her to rescue her kid. But obviously that doesn't work out. Speaking of which, I was annoyed enough when she appeared to be beaten to death in this scene. But then when she wakes up tied to a ladder, I thought to myself, Hey, Sybil is still alive. That must mean she's gonna get rescued. Nope. Cue gory death scene. It's like she gets killed off twice. It's just frustrating because Sybil is about the only character in this movie who appears to actually have a few working brain cells most of the time. Then someone hands her the idiot ball and that's that. By the way, I love this one cultist who literally points and laughs. It's like, hey, your face is on fire. Which brings us to the cultists wanting to burn Sharon too because that worked so well for them the first time. Then of course there are all the scenes with the poor husband and father where he basically discovers things just after Rose does, but like, less so. It's like Rose takes Sharon to Silent Hill. Chris finds out Rose is missing and he goes looking for her in Silent Hill. Rose discovers that Alessa has something to do with Sharon. Chris finds a picture of a girl who looks like Sharon. Rose finds out what happened to Alessa. Chris discovers that something bad happened at some point in the town's history. Rose rescues Sharon and they leave the town, although not really. Chris is made to go home. And it's all completely pointless. Apparently the Christopher scenes were added due to executive meddling because the movie would have had an all-female cast otherwise. And I can kind of understand why. Most people who watch horror movies are teenage and college-age guys who would not really be able to relate to a female character. Or at least this is probably how the studio saw it. I'm all for girl power, but I think Gan should have had the forethought to see this coming and just made a male and female lead like the game did. So am I saying the movie would have been better if they had stuck to the original story? Not necessarily. They could have found some other way to screw it up, but it probably would have been easier to avoid having the story end up such a convoluted mess. Because really, as Silent Hill games go at least, the first game's story is fairly straightforward. Certainly a lot more straightforward than this movie is. If you were to take out most of the boss fights and puzzles, and maybe have fewer locations so there isn't too much time wasted with having Harry run from one building to the next, but keep the story pretty much intact, you would have a nice creepy little tale about a father and how he's willing to go to hell and back for his little girl. He meets two women along the way, one he's able to save, the other he isn't. Or hell, maybe neither, I could deal with Sybil being killed off as long as it's handled well. And in the end, evil is defeated, but the ending would be bittersweet. It would have been faithful to the game, which could have made fans like me happy. There would have been enough disturbing stuff to keep horror fans happy. And yet it would have been unique enough, compared to other mainstream horror movies, that it might have even pleased newcomers, maybe even critics. Again, I'm not saying that following the game closely would automatically make a good movie. I'm just saying it could have worked, and it would have been interesting to see that attempted. It's not like the Silent Hill movie was all bad. The monsters look fantastic, partly because they were done with actors in costumes and practical effects instead of CG whenever possible, which is almost always a good thing, as I've said before. The locations look great, there's a lot of detail put into them. A few scenes are shot-for-shot -shot remakes of their game counterparts, which is pretty cool, if only from a technical standpoint. The transition to the other world, and really the other world in general, looks amazing. And that transition animation is something from the movie that I did not mind making it into later games. Even though I'm not crazy about a lot of the characters in this movie, I do think that the actors did a good job with what they were given. 
They even did most of their own stunts, which is pretty damn impressive, and looking at the making of videos, it looks like everyone involved had a blast making this movie. So I guess you could say I've developed a kind of an appreciation for the Silent Hill movie, just for the aspects that I just stated. I can understand people putting on this movie and turning their brain off just to appreciate seeing the Silent Hill world brought to life. But at the same time, that just makes it harder to bear. It's hard not to think if only this kind of love and care had been put into making an accurate adaptation of Silent Hill, if the director just hadn't tried to make it his own as much as he did, or at least was smarter about it, it could have been awesome. At this point I've pretty much come to terms with my hatred of this movie. I don't like it, but this is what we got and it is what it is. And of course we've got a sequel coming out which is supposed to follow Silent Hill 3 along with being a continuation of the first movie. At the time I'm making this video it has not come out yet, but from what I've seen it could easily go either way as far as making things better or worse in the Silent Hill movie adaptation department. I've seen some things that look promising, but I've seen just as many things that make me scratch my head and wonder what the hell the new director is smoking, so we'll just have to see how it goes. Well, that about wraps up the five major problems I have with the Silent Hill movie. There's probably more I could have mentioned, but I didn't want to be here all day. Well, that's it for now. See you next time. Congratulations, Rose. You're here. You did it. Your reward is... A new car!